Bob is the owner of the local hobby shop and president of the Remote Control Airplane Club. Each Wednesday after work, the members of the airplane club get together to race, share in the joy of airplanes, compare designs, and to pass on the knowledge of model airplanes to their kids and grandkids. Bob goes to a church service with his sister on Christmas Eve and decides to become a Christian. He regularly attends Sunday services, finds his way into a small group, and joins the Wednesday night church gathering. He realizes that his commitment to church programs and his commitment to the airplane club are at odds. The church leadership empathizes with the situation but tell him it'd be better to attend the Wednesday program rather than spend time building airplanes. The church leadership also encourages Bob to get more involved in the church, leaving no time for airplanes. Bob agrees. Giving up a silly hobby will be his sacrifice for the Lord. Eventually, Bob's friends begin wondering what happened to him. In their minds, he was a critical part of the model airplane community. When they'd wander into his hobby shop, they'd ask, What happened to you? We miss you. Bob begins to realize that he's becoming an outsider to all the conversations, significant or otherwise, that always unfolded during their Wednesdays together. Bob explains that he'd found something more important than model airplanes, and he even offers an invitation to the Wednesday night church meeting. Some of the airplane club try out his church because they respect and love Bob. But a lot of them decide not to go because they value the time together with family and friends on Wednesday evenings. After some time, Bob becomes a key leader in the church and hears his call to go and reach those people he knew from the club. Since giving up the regular meeting with the club, his interaction feels more difficult than he'd imagined. After all, Bob, their leader, left them for what seemed to be just another club on Wednesday evenings. Somewhat troubled, Bob decides to take a break from Wednesday night church gatherings and re-enter the world of model airplanes. Some in the church were deeply concerned for Bob's spiritual well-being. Others were disgruntled. Then someone asked the question, what if we resourced Bob to be even more effective at building healthy community where he already is? Let's help him to better live out more of Jesus' heart for compassion, generosity, peace, and love among people that know him best. After all, Bob is the most likely access point for those people to encounter Jesus. The church agrees. Bob's church is now determined to help him follow Jesus and assist him in living out his faith in the community that had been built around him. Bob now sees both his dedication to his church and to the model airplane community as critical components in following Jesus. So I want to just say real quick a little something about that video before we before I start, and that is, um, it is in no way intended to knock what happens here in this facility at all, because I think this is an opportunity for growth. But Bob is shaped. If you listen to that video, Bob is shaped for model airplanes. He's built community. That's where he has lived in. Um, those are the people that he has connected with. And so the things that I get from that is when he, he goes and he becomes a Christian and goes to church, those that come, come because of their relationship with Bob, their love for Bob. And you don't miss the irony here that where do, when he becomes a church leader, where do they send him off to go? To the very places with which he came. And so I want you to understand that my point for applying that as we enter into today's message is that you each, just like Bob, have been shaped a certain way. You have been blessed with a certain sphere of influence in your lives. It could be family, it could be friends, it could be people at your place of, of business. Be the best Jesus that you can in those environments. That's the place with which you can best, as they said at the end, if I get the word in there, they, they determined that he was the most likely access point to coming to faith. And so the last thing I'll say before I start today is, who in your life do you have more access to helping lead them to faith than anyone else in this room? Those are the people with which, as I preach today, have those people on your minds and in your hearts. Um, what you should notice, I believe, if I got it on there, on the back of your sermon uh, hand outline is there should be a couple of questions, correct? Did they get printed on there? About individuals to think about? And, yeah, so th that can be done after the fact, but I want you to be actively thinking. You're going to see more of this in 2021 as well. Some questions, thoughts, trying to provoke some thoughts about who is it with whom um, you are being called to reach. 
All right, so our, uh, our passage this morning is a familiar one. I've used this myself before, um, but I think this is a good launching point again for what will be the 2021 vision. Um, and so if you didn't see that again, I'll be mentioning this a lot more at our meeting uh, in two weeks, or in three weeks, I guess. But um, our vision for 2021 is each one reach one 10 by 10. Each of us, our, our, our vision is to reach one person with the gospel, with the goal of making 100 followers of Christ. So you may be doing the math and thinking, well, how is one going to get, you know, one each isn't going to get to 100? Well, then if you make one, well, what comes after one? You go to number two. But invest your time. It's about deep, deepening relationships, teaching people to obey God. All right, so Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do all I commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. My sermon in a sentence this week is this. The singular purpose for God sending his son in the flesh and for Jesus to suffer, bleed, and die, and then being raised from the dead is so that we would come to know God by the way of salvation. Now, God commanded us to share the gospel. It is absolutely crystal clear in that passage with the entire world. And he would not do that without giving us some guidelines and principles with which to equip us. So the commandment in verse 19 and 20, where it says, Go, therefore, and make disciples, follows the statement in verse 18. Here's what it said again. All power has been given to Jesus. The word power in Greek is exousia, which means access and authority. The Great Commission is given based upon Jesus' access and authority that is now open to the believer. How is it open to the believer? Where does our power come from? From the Spirit. Jesus then gives, after this, informing them of this, he gives the disciples first the mission of the church. Okay, this is our mission statement essentially here. It's, he gives us the go. Go, therefore. John 17, 18 says, As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Now, here's some. I actually had this preached to us one time, so this is not original to me, but I'll admit I don't know that I noticed this before. I didn't pay much attention to it. But did you notice that shortly after Jesus raised from the dead and he's, he, he, he shows himself to his uh, disciples that he doesn't tell them to go. He says, stop and wait. Now, he just told them a little bit ago to, to go, but now he's saying stop and wait. What's going on here? What are they waiting for? They're waiting for the Spirit to come into them. That's what he's telling them to wait for. Once they have the Spirit, they are released to go and change the world because they have been given access and authority to power. My friends, this same spirit is in you if you believe in Jesus. You have been given access and authority. You can now go. This is the go in the gospel. Thank you for not getting up and leaving. Uh, this is the go in the gospel. God did not redeem you in his kingdom to be idle. He has a purpose for each and every one of us. The mere fact that you are breathing and that blood is still flowing in your body and through your veins is evidence that God is not done with you. He wants you to share with someone else the good news that was shared with you. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, 
We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Now, an ambassador does not operate in this capacity when they're in their own homeland. They operate this way when they're in a foreign country. And so as ambassadors for Christ, we represent him in the world, not only in the church. So after the go, the second thing is to get in the game. Now in an editorial that I read several years ago, James Jones wrote this. A few days ago, we were watching a great game on television. There was a fierce competition. The score was close. Time was running out. The team that was ahead was in the huddle. They stayed there, in the huddle. They stayed and stayed. The referee blew his whistle and penalized the team for delaying the game. They had stayed too long in the huddle. Now huddles are necessary, but games aren't won in the huddle. They are one on the line. Strategy sessions are important, but we can stay in the huddle too long. You see, many important pieces are discussed here in the church. But discussing the work of the church should never keep us from doing the work of the church. If we stay in the safe confines of our huddle, we disobey God's command to be salt and light to the earth. Congregations every Sunday all over the world meet. They huddle together Sunday after Sunday, only to re-huddle again the following week. They never manage to get off the line of scrimmage, or get to the line of scrimmage. In fact, the whole church is gaining a worldwide reputation for huddling. We flock to ourselves. We talk to ourselves. We huddle with our heads around the Lord's table. And some of the team are even careless enough that, in, that we don't even make the huddle. We don't show up to the huddle. Now, worship is essential. Hear that. And it is important. It is vital. But only if it inspires us to get out and do something. When we huddle here on Sundays... Let this be a time where we actively ask, listen to one another, and share about how God is at work outside of your huddle. This is a challenge for 2021, conversationally, for myself as well, when we are together, intentionally encourage one another. Take time after church or before church to find a quiet space with someone and Ask them how they're doing and how you can help them in their journey of faithfulness to doing God's work. You see, believing is a spectator sport. Following is when you get in the game. And it's done through obedience. Now for Bob in our video, the game was reaching those in his model airplane activity. Where's the game for you? But God doesn't leave it there. He, he also gives us the grace. See, God is not looking in, the, looking in the business of our ability. How often do we think, well, I just, I don't have that ability. I can't do this or that. And we diminish what God can do. But he's looking for our availability. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 15, verse 10, but whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me, and not without results. For I have worked harder than all the other apostles, yet it was not I, but God who was working through me by his grace. You don't have to know the Bible from Genesis to Revelation to fulfill God's mission for your life and his mission for the church. Being available for God's use to share what he wants you to, when he wants you, and whom he wants you to share it to. 
So he's given us a mission. The mission is clear. We are to make disciples. But he also gives us the method. So the method of the church is that we and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that he has commanded. You see, salvation is the making of the church. Baptism is the marking. And then discipleship is the maturing of believers to their full potential. How do we do that? We teach them to obey all that Jesus commanded. So how do we do that? Well, we need to know what Jesus commanded. But it's as simple as saying, you know what, let's journey together. Let's, you know, let's take the Gospel of John or Luke, and would you join with me, you know, for the next three months? Let's meet once a week, six months, whatever. Let's journey through here and let's see what, what Jesus has commanded us to do. Because each one of us in this room can say, you know what, there are some commandments that we have not been faithful in following too. But intentionally, diving into the lives of those that God has placed in your path. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, but with gentleness and respect. So, the proper position for God. It says, again, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. When we sanctify something, it means we set it apart for a purpose. So the very first thing is, have you set God apart in your hearts? Which, when we see the word written in Scripture with hearts, it's talking about more than just our physical heart. It's talking about our spirit and our soul. To the very most inner parts of our being, is God set apart in our lives? He must be first, and it must be who we are. Our identity must be found in Christ if we are to be effective in our witness to Him. So our, the very first step in this is making sure that our spiritual well-being is strengthened. We cannot take someone where we have not gone. We also have the proper preparedness of the believer, that we must always be ready to give an answer to every man. This applies to me. This applies to you. And this applies to every born-again believer. However, for us to be ready, we have to study to show ourselves approved. Paul said, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a worker who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Now let me say one thing here. I'm, Tim, since you're new here, I'm going to go off script here for just a second, so bear with me here. But just realize that this passage where it says, always be prepared to give an answer. You know, sometimes that has been a stumbling block for people because they get asked a question and they don't know the answer to it. And they think, what am I supposed to I'm supposed to have the answer for this. You know, right? I'm just told i got to have the answer for it. Well, I don't have the answer, so what do I do with this? It's okay to not have every answer. Don't try to make up an answer just because it sounds good. Ask a question. Or... One of the awesome experiences that I've enjoyed in life is, you know what, you, and I've said this to people, sometimes even if I know the answer, but I've discerned, you know what, it's going to be better. This relationship would be more fruitful if I don't answer the question and instead say, you know what, let's take some time and journey through this together and see what we can find. So having an answer sometimes can be, you know what, let's journey through this, or you know what, I don't know. Let's talk it out. Let's talk to someone else. Let's Bring in other resources. So don't allow that to... I, I hear that stumbling block maybe more than anything else in terms of witnessing to people. What if they ask the question I don't know the answer to? I've been there a lot of times. Um, but the journey, when, they, when they're willing to go with you, if you're real with them, the journey is so much more fruitful because you're doing it together. But study... 
That does not mean neglect the study as well. If it's because you have not been prepared, if you've not diligently prepared yourself, then that's another story. He has already given us the access and authority, and he reassures us with the power of his presence. In Hebrews 13, verse 5, we read, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, in the military, they define leadership as the ability to influence others into the accomplishment of a mission while providing purpose, direction, and motivation. God is a great, mighty leader. He gives us the purpose, which is our mission, and he gives us the direction, which is this method. And he also gives us motivation to reassure us of his presence. And God also gives us power. So after he gives us this access and authority, he gives us, as we've, I've already kind of referenced this, but he gives us the ability that we need through the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all of Judea, and in Sumeria, and into the uttermost parts of the earth. Here, the Greek word for power is dunamis, which means ability in abundance. Jesus gave his disciples the pattern for evangelism here in this verse. The rest of the book of Acts is a pattern or that follows this pattern. Here's the pattern. First, we each have to receive the power from the Spirit. So the first question you have to ask yourself is, are you saved? Do you know Jesus? Is the Spirit living within you? If that's the case, witness in Jerusalem and Judea. No, that doesn't mean get up and go there now. What's he saying there? Well, he's talking to the Jewish people. That's their immediate surrounding. So, if you're saved and you have the Holy Spirit in you, today, not tomorrow, not next week, today, starting today, look for where you can minister in your immediate surrounding areas. Be it Grove City, be it Litchfield, be it in your own home, be it in the community, be it in your jobs. That's your immediate surrounding location. That's your Jerusalem and Judea. Then witness to Samaria. Well, that was kind of the surrounding areas for me, being living in Litchfield or in Grove City. I mean, that's that would be like Litchfield, maybe Wilmer, Cosmos. Those are the areas that are kind of just beyond my normal everyday reach, but that are within my area still of potential influence. That's next. And then the world. Okay? So those are all, that's the pattern. And so in doing this, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my spot here a second. Um, yeah, so the gospel was preached to Jerusalem and Judea first, and then spread out throughout the whole world. So we first need to share his goodness with those we come into contact with on a regular basis. What are we trying to do? We're trying to use the two premises, which was in uh, Matthew chapter 28. Baptize them. So that means we're helping them find Jesus so that they can be baptized. And then teaching them to obey all that Jesus has commanded. And so in doing that, we can reciprocate the gospel message to the whole world. This is the each one reach one. I think about the candles from Christmas Eve. You know, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm lighting down the aisle. And part of me wanted to redo that again today intentionally with the, okay, here's what we're going to do. So picture this. You can picture this in your mind. On this side, I'm going to light Layton's candle. And then I'm going to go around and light every single candle there myself. On this side, I'm going to light Aaron's and Brett's candles. And then between the two of you, you guys spread it. Who's going to, I mean, assuming that the sizes were equal, who's going to get done first? Yeah, why? More people, more workers. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Do your part where you are. You don't have to do someone else's part. You don't have to do my job. You don't have to do anybody else's job. Do your job. Do your part. Who do you know personally? And maybe this is the person that you write down to answer the question later. Who do you know personally that you speak to regularly 
but have never shared the gospel with. Ask the Spirit to lead you in witnessing to this individual. Or to these, maybe there's more than one person. And, ex- and allow God to work through you. Finally, in this, we have God's position. So as he raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. Let me read it again. He has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What greater motivation do you need than that? God has raised us together with Christ and has positioned us in heavenly places. This gives us the assurance of salvation and must motivate us to share the good news with others. We are to do as Paul did with Timothy. And this is fast becoming one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. And it's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. The things which you have heard from me. This is Paul talking to Timothy. The things you, Timothy, have heard from me, Paul, all that you have learned, and if you read earlier in 2 Timothy, he refers to Timothy as his son. He loves Timothy so much that he is like, he has become like a son to him, to Paul. He is dearly loved. So he says, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will also be able to teach others. Men, who in this church can you say is like a son? Or who loves you as though you were like their son? Women, the same could be said about daughters. Who here do you love like a daughter? Who here loves you like a daughter? That's the kind of love that needs to be present. It doesn't just happen. You know, you know, it's not like the birth of your own child where it's like, okay, you've got, you have literal flesh in the game. We have flesh in the game, but the flesh here, it's, it's spirit in the game. We are to love one another like sons and daughters and brothers and sisters. So, for this next year, for 2021, here is our vision. I'm going to try to lay this out as clearly as I can this morning and then do more of it as we go. It's for each one of you, whether you are present this week. You know what? We've got a great place to start because I know of a handful of people that are gone on vacation. They're not with us on Zoom, maybe. They may be on different... So, you know what? The first thing when you see people is, the next time you see them, if you don't see them here this morning, is, you know what? Who are you thinking about? Who's God placing on your heart? Have you been praying about who God wants you to reach? Start seasoning our conversations less about football, less about the weather, but more about how is God, who is God calling you to reach, and how's it going? How can I help you? How can I give you what you need? How can I give you resources? I hope that to be as consistent to say to you, how can I resource you? You know, can I come in and help some? Sure, of course, probably in some cases. But more importantly, how can I help you minister? How can you help one another? How can you encourage one another? It is so vital. So each one reach one, helping them to be baptized, and then intentionally journeying alongside of them as they grow. Teaching them how, what? What are we to teach them? How to obey Jesus' commands. All of them. And our effort, 100 faithful followers of Christ. Does that mean we're going to have 100 new bodies here? Not necessarily. In fact, I personally, I kind of pray that some of those will be um, individuals who are ministering to Samaria as their home base, or they're ministering out in the world. They're going maybe to the cities to work, to have ministry outlets that are not in this area. What's your part in this? Now, if you still have any doubt about what's your role, maybe you're sitting here still thinking, you know what, I'm just one guy or one woman. I you know, I'm just I don't have any special talents. I don't, you know, I have this, I have these barriers. You can you could probably list all of these reasons why you shouldn't do it or can't do it. And while this this message must be meant for someone else, not you. 
I'll tell you what, this may be the most relevant message that I've preached since I've been here for every single one of you. So I'm going to close with this story. I shared this at the uh, deacon meeting a couple months back. This is powerful, powerful story. This is uh, the importance of each one being ready. That's the premise here. James Merritt tells the story of a man named Robert Eaglin, who was a deacon of a church in Colchester, England. He woke up one Sunday morning in January of 1837. The ground was blanketed with a foot of snow. He started to turn over and go back to sleep. But he thought to himself, I am one of the deacons of the church. If the deacons don't go, who will go? He put on his boots, his hat and coat, and walked six miles in the snow to church. He was right. Most of the members did stay home. As a matter of fact, even the pastor didn't show up. Only 13 people were at church. Twelve members and a 13-year-old boy he had never seen before. Somebody said, why don't we just sing a little bit and go home? We don't have a preacher. But Robert Eaglin said, it's foolish for us to come all this way and not have a worship service. Well, who's going to preach, they asked. Impulsively, Robert said, I'll preach. He'd never preached in his life. He got up and did not know what he was going to preach. He was not a member of the clergy. He'd never attended minister's training. All he knew was that there was a need, and he asked God to fill it through him. In his quiet time the day before, he had been reading in Isaiah. So he turned to Isaiah 45, verse 22, which says this, Look unto me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Later, he recalled, I preached maybe 12 minutes, and I must have said 50 times, look to Jesus. It was all that he knew to say. Look to Jesus. He got through with saying, look to Jesus about 50 times, and he saw that boy, that 13-year-old boy, and he said one more time, young man, if you'll look to Jesus, you'll be saved. And they had prayer and left. That boy, years later, wrote these words. I did look. And then and there the cloud in my heart lifted. The darkness rolled away. At that moment I saw the sun. I accepted Christ into my heart. And I was born again. That 13-year-old boy was Charles Spurgeon. Robert Eaglin didn't get up that day and preach a message about how to, be, how to be up when the weather is down. He did not get up that day and say, let's talk to you today about how to glow in the snow. Thank God he preached and shared what he knew, and God blessed it. Charles Spurgeon needed to hear the word that morning, and God blessed it. Millions of lives were touched by Spurgeon throughout the generations, and still to this day. Why? Because Eaglin had an ear to hear and a mouth to proclaim. Do you have an ear? Do you have a mouth? Then God can do the same with you. Church, we were made for a time such as this. It is time to seize that purpose that God has called each of us into today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you because we know how awesome you are and what you've made it us to be. Lord, you have uh, you made us out of the dust of the earth, Lord, and yet we are um, 
the pinnacle of your creation, Lord, that we were created to tend to the earth and to um, be over and take care of the animals, Lord. And, and even with, uh, with sin present, Lord, we are, we are called to work, Lord, and the work is, uh, has changed a little bit. And that, yes, we still tend to the earth and we still take care of the animals, but we are also placed here intentionally um, to bring your name to all people. So, Lord, I just pray a, uh, a Holy Spirit-only type of boldness upon each person in this room uh, that are on Zoom, uh, Lord, that are associated with this church. Give us the boldness to reach out to those with whom, um, first, that we have daily contact with that we may not um, have shared the gospel with. Lord, give us the boldness with those with whom we have shared the gospel with, that maybe even have a relationship with you to say, let me walk alongside you and, and let's grow together. Let's sharpen one another so that we can lead others to Christ. Lord, we are not here only to glean information from your word. Lord, that is a great foundation, but in your word it teaches us that uh, we are to do something with it. We are to obey it and to act on it. And that we are being unfaithful if we just sit on our words. I think back to a message from the past about the fact that we are like a doctor who has the hope of the cure, the antidote to what ails people. But what kind of a doctor are we if we don't share it with others? And of the man in prison, who has the news of what it takes to release a man from bondage. And yet he sleeps with that letter underneath his pillow. Lord, help us to be faithful in the little things. Lord, we know that, that we want to see great things happen, but we also see from Scripture that you entrust us little things at a time, that you long for faithful followers. Lord, help us to be faithful in the little daily tasks. Lord, wherever our game is, maybe it's not model airplanes, Lord, but we all have um, flesh in some game somewhere. Lord, help us to be um, keeping you at the forefront of those relationships. Lord, help us to minister and to walk alongside. Help us to, to, this year, as we seek to reach one, to do so intentionally, Lord. But I also ask uh, for the courage, the courage to be able to, uh, to go to another, uh, to, for men to go to other men in the church or women to women and say, you know what, would you help keep me accountable? Would you, uh, would you walk along with me as well to help continue to build me up, to encourage me, to be someone that I can go to when I have a need, that I can pray with, that will pray for me. Lord, we all need that. None of us ex exempt. Lord, we just, we want to be available. We want to be available to you. And we pray that you, uh, you use these available vessels for you in the years to come. And Lord, we just ask that you bless it. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the benediction and we'll have one closing song. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Go in peace. Amen.